It is uh, my uh, great pleasure now to welcome the Honourable Matthew Guy, MP, Leader of the Opposition and Leader of the Victorian Liberal Party. And uh, we uh, await with interest, Matthew, because um, something is happening next month and I'm sure you have some good news for us, uh, one way or another. Not that you haven't supported um, Royal Councils uh, at previous forums, but uh, we do welcome you here today and uh, I suppose pre-empting whatever happens, we wish you well next month and uh, uh, we welcome you to the podium now to uh, bring us up to speed. And ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome Matthew Guy. Uh, thank you very much. Um, you're right, Councillor, something very important is happening next month very important. It's my wife's birthday and I haven't forgotten. <laughs> and um, I'm just working out what I've, got to, what I've got to do to prepare for it, where I'm going to get the time to prepare for it, but it's the most important thing in the month. Um, thank you very much for the chance to say a few words. Thanks very much again to talk to Rural Councils Victoria. And um, as you know, I've, I've been here a couple of times and uh, I really have enjoyed um, your frankness, your openness as an organisation. I know you do with every political party, as you'd expect, and just the dialogue. And I know a number of councils in the room. And when I go to Country Victoria, people are pretty willing to uh, sit down, have conversations about local issues, political issues, community issues. So um, thank you all very much for the um, for the way that, as an organisation, but also as councillors, conducting yourself, and um, both in opposition and government, um, being as frank as you can which I think is certainly what is needed in the political situation today. Um, without being flippant about it, there is an election, obviously, in uh, 38 days' time. And, of course, that means in the next 38 days, you'll have commitments from me, from my opponent, from the Greens, from independents. I think the critical thing for all of us is to start to focus on what is realistic, what is achievable, what are the time frames, uh, who can deliver what they're saying, uh, and importantly, importantly, um, who's got a plan and who's going to provide a vision that is going to be there to govern for all of Victoria. And one of my mantras clearly over the last three years, uh, and again through this election, will be around uh, decentralisation and growing all of the state, which is something I've been very passionate about, both as a minister and again as an opposition leader, and now you're starting to see through a number of policy announcements as well. Um, my team is ready. My team comes from a diverse background, as I think I said this last time. We are people from country, from regional, from metro, older, younger, male, female, whatever. We are there as a diverse team, people who have been ministers, people who are shadow ministers, people who are new to the team, people who have been there for 25 years. So we've got a mix of people and age groups and experience which we want to bring to government. People like myself and Peter Walsh who have been ministers before, Michael O'Brien, the shadow treasurer who's been the treasurer before. Uh, so uh, we can form a government to hit the ground running. We don't need the induction course as some new governments do. Um, we are people who have got the experience to govern and we're keen, obviously, to do that. Uh, unlike some political outfits, federal or state, uh, we've been united. Uh, we've been a unified outfit for all of our four years in opposition. We didn't come into opposition, focus on ourselves and whinge and say the public got it wrong. We just got on with the job and did what we believe needed to be done and that is provide Victoria with an opposition and then an alternative to what they have of the government of the day. And yet, of course, in the first year or two, that means you've got to be negative, negative, negative. That is the role of opposition leader. It's not uh, Mr. Positive Leader, unfortunately. It's, a, it's an opponent's job. But obviously, as time goes on, you then start to set out those political messages and narratives about where you want to take the state and the alternative vision you have. Now we're in that period. Um, it allows us, myself and my colleagues, to talk a lot more about that. Um, so uh, it is, as I said, a we're going to be another, uh, certainly a busy 38 days and my lack of sleep and lack of uh, nights at home is uh, tantamount to that. Um, there are a couple of macro issues which are still dominating uh, around the state. Wherever I go and I can see it in research, I can see it in media feedback, I can see it when I go and talk to people across the state. Principally, of course, uh, still around community safety and law and order. And in the outer suburbs of Melbourne, in regional towns, in interface, areas, peri-urban areas, the reality is that the 11% rise in crime, the 38% rise in, uh, in assaults, the 43% rise in break-ins is not just a Melbourne problem. It's not just a Melbourne problem. And this issue has been running around our state now at an exasperated level for particularly uh, four years, uh, the last three in fact. Um, we reached stratospheric levels of crime in Victoria, they've dropped off from Mount Everest down to K2, but they are still much, much higher than every other state in relative terms. What that means is that my site has articulated a vision for uh, 
mandatory minimum jail time to repeat violent offenders, wherever they may be, for bail reform, parole reform, for bringing back a police in schools program right across the state. Police in schools is not police at the school, it is police talking to students like Fire Brigade does, like AMBOs do, and actually telling students about what they do with uh, their job and telling them how they need to uh, uphold the law and why it's important to do so, for instance, uh, building a relationship of trust. Also, mandatory drug rehabilitation for minors. So magistrates can actually send some of those kids, and I know ICE crime in particular, a number of country towns is quite substantial, uh, a facility where children can be sent, minors can be sent to get off drugs so that we don't see them before the criminal justice system for the rest of their life. We don't want them to do that. We don't want that to happen. But we need to have different ways, which are not just focused on ways of the past, which have been there for 30 years and are not working. Cost of living issues uh, around the state, which are quite substantial. It's why the other day I launched a program around free school books for state secondary students across the state, up to $750 per family for each secondary student in, uh, in a public school in, uh, in the senior levels, year 11 and 12, $450 on average. It's a big deal. It's a big deal to a lot of families who are doing it tough with utilities prices that have never been as high, particularly gas, particularly water, particularly electricity. And so we need to provide some direct and tangible ways to make life easier for people rather than just hoping uh, that they can get by. Uh, we've made some commitments around gas, and I know some in the room will like it, some won't, but that's where we stand. We believe that we've got natural gas reserves that we should be availing. And for those who say to me, well, that means fracking, uh, but Victoria has a brown coal base. For anyone who has a geological background, brown coal, you can't frack. Brown coal is mud. So you can't crack or frack brown coal. You can with black coal, but Victoria does not have a black coal base, it's brown. So the necessity to frack or the ability to frack in Victoria is non-existent. But conventional onshore gas is something we believe we need to avail, pardon me, and use, and put in place Victoria's first royalty system for landholders and surrounding landholders, surrounding landholders as well, who should be able to benefit from a resource that is there in Victoria, which we believe we should be using. It is clean, it is efficient, and it is a way forward uh, that can uh, manage us out of a uh, predominantly coal-fired electricity situation in Victoria. But one of the key issues, of course, that I uh, have talked about for a long time and I want to again talk about today and some of my policy incentives around it is around decentralisation. One thing that is absolutely clear in our state is that we cannot continue to grow Victoria for the next 30 years the way we have grown the last 30 years. I keep saying this after function after function I go to and people say, well, what does that mean? What that means is to have state policy settings which accept as the norm that Melbourne grows at nine, takes 92% of the state's economic and population growth with 75% of the population, that is unsustainable. You cannot build a state with 90% of the people going to one location and a further three or four percentage points going to the Greater Geelong region as well. So we've got the Port Phillip Bay Basin, which is dragging literally all our economic and population growth. As many of you in the room will know, within 100 miles of here, we've got population decline in a number of councils. We have resources that are underutilised, schools, childcare facilities. We have towns like Warrnambool, cities like Warrnambool, who are struggling to get people to work there, to actually fill the jobs that are in those cities. So we have a policy setting in Victoria that is skewed the wrong way, funnelling everything into Melbourne, which is utterly unsustainable. Country and regional Victoria's growth is dependent on Melbourne, but Melbourne is dependent on country and regional Victoria far more than it realises. The sustainable growth of both mean that you have to look at growth between each other, not in a, singularly, a singular basis. And that means that we need to have a policy setting that is completely different for, in my view, the next government and beyond because population growth is central to everything a government does. Economic growth, it's central to transport, to logistics, to climate, to land use, to water, everything. The ABS have fundamentally underestimated Victoria and Greater Melbourne's growth for the best part of 25 years. Underestimated it. What they are saying on mid-range predictions is that Melbourne's about to add the population of Brisbane in the next 24 years. Melbourne's about to add the population of Brisbane in the next 24 years. How on earth is that sustainable for our state, for all of our state, that you've got one great big heaving city mass of seven and a half million people and you've got population decline outside of that? People come in, they say, oh, we've got to build a new city between Melbourne and Sydney. Why do we need to build a new city? 
Why would we dig up good farmland to build a new city? We've got plenty of cities that can sustainably manage growth with the right policy framework in place and infrastructure to back it. We don't need to build any new cities. We have cities, plenty of them. Towns and cities which are ready for growth with assistance. Three years ago, I established the Victorian Population Task Force. I put Tim Smith, who is now Shadow Minister for Education, in charge of that. To go around to many of you, I know he saw, and around country and regional Victoria, about what are the incentives to decentralise our population? What are the structural incentives that we all face? Noting that this is not a short or medium term issue for us as uh, legislators, as councillors, as council, senior council officials, it's not a small issue for us to address or to change, but we must start somewhere, noting that it was done in the north of the UK, in parts of East Germany, in the midwest of the US, in the prairies in Canada. What is it that we need to do to change the way the government structured and run in Victoria as to grow outside of Melbourne to provide those incentives? Central to that feedback was around health and transport, key issues around health and transport. It was also about saying that we don't just want to create the city of Casey and dump it in Ballarat and then say that's the answer to decentralisation. It's not. It's not just about having commutable distance to Melbourne because it's not all about Melbourne. It's about growing those domestic economies so that they then can grow unto themselves and we can have a population that can sustain itself. What are those incentives? Getting back in control of population, because population growth in this state is, in this city in particular, is completely out of control, uh, needs a number of structural changes from the start. I'm the Shadow Minister for Population, as well as the, the uh, Opposition Leader. As Premier, I'd be the Minister for Population. It's the first one in Australia, uh, at a state level. We don't have a Population Minister at a state level. People have just never taken this issue seriously. They never talked about it, wonder why I talked about it. Why do you have regional growth plans? It was all about population. We need to have someone who is focused on population growth and then overseeing the Population Commission. The commission which we will establish is around the advice, not just Victorian future and ABS figures, but coordinating what government does not do well, and that is between departments when either structure plans are approved or town boundaries are changed and councils have directions or councils have ideas. What is the infrastructure that's going to be required to make that sustainable at a point in time? And how do we avail it? Do we avail it through works in kind, which has been scrapped for four years, put on the back burner, not interested at a state level? Do we avail it through taxation? Do we avail it through a treasury contribution? Do we avail it through PPP? We need to have a coordinating body within the state between departments, which currently there is nothing within the state structure about managing, coordinating population growth pressures for particularly peri-urban areas, but also country councils that are now developing population growth at rates they've never experienced before and will continue to. That population commission is very, very important. Secondly is the Minister for Decentralisation. We haven't had one of those for 38 years. My Minister for Decentralisation will be someone who will then be in Cabinet. Their responsibility will be to oversee all infrastructure and Cabinet briefs with a recommendation about how this applies to our goal of decentralising population. So thus, there is no point just saying, well, we've got two priorities. Uh, one is the redevelopment, hypothetically, of the Austin Hospital. Please don't quote me on this. There's a journalist in the room. This is not a policy, right? I'm going to get in trouble. One is the Austin Hospital. One is the Warrigal Hospital. They're at equal need. What do we do first? What you do first is to say that if we have a policy of decentralisation, you provide an incentive to go out first. You've got to put a priority on what is going to live up to the government's policies of decentralisation. We also need to have, um, and I know a number in the room have said this and regional councils of Victoria have said the same to me, why do you want to have a minister for Geelong? Geelong is very important because it's the first part of the state, I know it's not a rural council quite obviously, but it can sustain great growth quickly, sustainably, with a planned Geelong planning statement, a minister for Geelong, and of course a Geelong metro system, a rail network, which will expand to Colac, which will go to Bannockburn, linking back into the western suburbs in Werribee. And that means you start to put in place infrastructure that services more than just the regional city or the city in Geelong's case to grow it to half a million people. People can live and work in Winchelsea or Colac and commute. Same with Bannockburn. They actually got a commutable rail service. This is what they have in Newcastle on the Hunter Valley. We do not have this in Victoria. We've never had urban rail networks outside of Melbourne. We've had tram networks we abolished in the 60s, now we'll have a rail network. We need to put that infrastructure in place. 
I've said this to a number of councils, a uh, number of functions before, and I'll say it again. On top of this is a government policy of decentralisation that mat matches your visions for regions and councils, how we market ourselves. Bendigo is a major regional financial capital, Wodonga is a driver education and training centre, it might be Portland as a renewables hub, or Warrnambool as a, a food processing centre, what it may be. Because at the moment when the state and federal governments go overseas, they're marketing your cities differently to you. They're marketing your councils and regions differently to you, if they're doing it at all. We've got to have a consistent theme between what we're saying to people wanting to invest in this country and what you're saying, because at the moment we're not. Central to decentralisation, I've always said, uh, was around rail. Now, being a bit of a, uh, coming from a bit of a, a rail nut family, my dad's a huge train buff, I had a bit of knowledge around trains, and so therefore it was with much pleasure I launched our initiative for a $19 billion rebuild of the country and regional rail network. Usually, politicians say, we're going to upgrade the country rail network, we're going to have fast trains to Geelong, Ballarat and Bendigo. That's it. That's country. That's the country rail network upgrade. 24 hours ago, I think my opponent just did this, but took out Bendigo. We're going to have country trains that are fast. They're going to go to Geelong and to Ballarat. The point about upgrading the whole network, which is what my plan is, is that if you want to have connectivity, if you want people to live in Bensdale or Wangaratta or Echuca or Swan Hill, You've actually got to have a rail network that services everyone and no treasury will come back and say that isn't going to be as profitable, that's not going to be profitable, you can't do this. I've got news for you, the Melbourne rail network doesn't make money either, but it's a necessity. And that's why we've said, I've said, if I'm elected in 38 days time, we want to rebuild the country rail network. Yes, some, ne some lines will be faster than others. 200 k's to Terralgan because it's upgrading the existing track, which is cheaper, and then 160 from Terralgan to Bansdale. That's much... We can think of the a number of services once we get around the hassle with uh, getting in from Dandenong to the city, the number of additional services you can provide, the time limit you can cut from Sale, from Bansdale, from Terralgan to Melbourne. Nearly $1.5 billion for the northeastern line. The standard gauge northeastern line. It's not even our line, it's ARTC. But it's about time someone said, we've got to put money into this. You know, the feds have said, we'll put a few hundred mil. The state said, you know, we'll play funny money and put in 120 million. It needs one and a bit billion dollars to upgrade it to 160k an hour standard, like it is in New South Wales on the other side of the border. To run second generation velocity trains at 100 miles an hour between Albury, Wodonga, Wangaratta, Benalla, Euroa, Seymour and Melbourne. In a proper, a proper service for the North East, a proper service that you'd expect, and the broad gauge line to Shepparton to do the same. And then through the Bendigo corridor, the faster trains, again upgrading the class one track that's 160 now, cantilevering some of those curves a bit more, uh, uh, I mean another 0.2 degrees or something I think it is, or two degrees. And then you can get trains of 200, and then upgrading to 130 services to Echuca, to Swan Hill, where we've made a commitment, I might add, to rebuild the hospital, to actually have proper services, not the four and four hour, four hour, what is it, four hour and 40 minutes I was on the train for going to Swan Hill, for goodness sake. And then to the west of Victoria, not just to upgrade to Ballarat, not just to upgrade to, uh, to uh, Ararat, but to extend the line once and for all from Maryborough to Donald and then to Mildura. We're going to put in an extra $80 million to remove the level crossings once, whenever, the Murray Basin Rail Project is completed, which allows us to run passenger trains at around 110 k's an hour, because they're lighter weight compared to the freight trains, and actually reinstate a passenger service, as we can do from a shuttle service on the standard gauge from Ararat, once they reach Ararat, the broad gauge service, you can change and go to Horsham again, through Stall and Horsham, or down to Hamilton. People say to me, why would you want to bring trains back to Hamilton? Why would I not? Why would I not? Why would I say it's only about growing certain parts of the state? What about we think differently and say the way to decentralise is for government to show that we have faith in country Victoria to grow as well? If government doesn't have that faith, if government doesn't provide that investment, well, why would the private sector? Why would you move? Why would a family say, well, we might just up and move to, like, one of my school friends who lives near Dalesford? Why would 
Other families do the same. If government aren't willing to invest in the service, to upgrade the Swan Hill Hospital, to upgrade the Warrigal Hospital, to upgrade the Echuca Hospital, to upgrade the Warrnambool Hospital, like I want to do for those. Because you have to invest in services for people to actually see it as an option. One of the other policies we announced recently is to have a tax review of all state taxes and recommendations to the federal feds about federal taxes, about how are we going to grow jobs in country and regional Victoria? Because job growth is central to it, and not just in... You know, I know Edith, Ernst & Young or PwC aren't going to pack up and move to Morwell. I know that. I'm not asking them to. But I am trying to find ways to incentivise growth. If we're going to have a whole-of-government strategy about growing the state differently, what are some of those incentives on taxation? Is it payroll tax? Is it substantially lower payroll tax? Is it land tax? Is it planning systems? What is going to encourage business to stay and grow in country Victoria? Is it direct government grants to business? Is it the relocation of government services, like I've said for Vic Roads and maybe V-Line to Ballarat? Is it others? So that review will be very important to give a very clear, a very clear understanding of what is going to be necessary in a state sense, a taxation sense, to provide those incentives. I know I'm running out of time, I just want to run through very quickly some other policies which we've announced for regional and country Victoria. As I said, the $80 million upgrade on the Mildura line is very important. And I single that one out because it says, along with the uh, Murray Basin Rail Project, we will invest the money to guard the level crossings to run passenger trains again. We'll put the money in. No one ever says, oh, we'll just bring it back. But you don't put the infrastructure in, so it never happens. It's an $80 million investment to bank on top of what the feds have done with that project and the state's supposedly managing it, is to upgrade it and do it properly. $160 million to bring back the Country Roads and Bridges Fund. Because we know, we know how important it is for those small country roads and bridges to get the support you need from the state to actually avail those roads being upgraded. Something which I think is small but important, the reinstating of regional and country sittings of the parliament. We used to do this. This is the only term we haven't done it. I remember being an upper house member where the parliament sat in Lakes Entrance. We're obviously coming back, are we? <laughs> It's an important message to all of Victoria that the Parliament goes out of Melbourne and actually not just as a ceremonial sitting, but in my view should do a week of session in the country. People then can come and see us on their turf about some of the issues important to us. Politicians get out. They hear from people locally. It's very important for the upper house where I suspect no one will have a majority. That will be very important to have those conversations for all of those politicians the re-establishment re of a Victorian major events company with a mandate specifically to attract events to country and regional Victoria. It's been scrapped, it should be brought back. A dedicated livestock and rural crime squad with Victoria Police, targeting stock theft. <coughs> no one's focusing on stock theft, which is enormous, which is massively costly, which is hurting many farmers, many of them now drought affected, and which we need to have a direct investment in. $40 million for a new Grow Victoria food and fibre exports program. Builds on the work that we'd previously done in government to actually grow Victorian business opportunities in the food and fibre sectors. Ladies and gentlemen, I know I've talked for a while, I don't want to talk for any more. I know there's questions you want to ask, but I just simply say this. The way our state is growing is not sustainable. You can't change everything overnight, but we must start somewhere. It's not an ideological argument. It's not a I'm better than him, he's better than me argument. It's an argument about fact. If we are going to bequeath to our kids and our grandkids a sustainable Victoria in everything we do, then we can't continue to keep funneling 90% of the population growth of this state into Melbourne. It's not sustainable. For country towns, which are dying on their feet because they can't get people and business and jobs to grow, and Melbourne that's sucking everything up like the 1950s movie The Blob. It's not sustainable. We've got to do something different. And to start that, you need a massive attitude change within government and an infrastructure program that sets an agenda that says we believe in this and we need to do business differently. If I'm elected in 38 days' time, 
the core long-term focus that I want to bring to the state is that change in direction, a change in focus of our state. We're the same size as Great Britain, 227,000 square kilometres, yet 75% of our population lives in one location, and that is not sustainable. The future of your councils and your towns and our families, our children, those who want to stay here in Victoria, depends on a different way, and the different way is to decentralise. That's my long-term message to this room, to hope that I can form a government and partner with you to achieve it, to start it, because once it's started, it's a policy trend which can't be reversed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthew. I wish you well for the next 38 days. Um, as chairman, I get first bite of the cherry here, so I, I do have a question. Um, <clears throat> with the promises and uh, the roads and bridges was one, we have heard you before on that and you have been emphatic along with Peter Walsh, so uh, we look forward to that if you are successful. And I suppose from our own um, area here today that we have been very well supported over the years by both sides of government with $3.5 million to support RCV over the term of uh, the government. So if I could put the question to you, it is in our um, forward project um, document to you that the support of rural councils of $3.5 million uh, over the term of the next election, if you could make comment on that one. Is it, what was it, 3.5? 3.5 over three years. Did the government commit to 3.5 over three years? 3.8. <laughs> you knew what I was going to say, didn't you? Well, if they've committed to 3.5, I hereby commit to $3.51 million over the next three years. <laughs> Go and talk to Kat. She's got a checkbook down there. So. <laughs> Sorry. The back. Uh, Katrina Rainsford, Southern Grampians, uh, congratulations on your presentation, Matthew, and we need a good competition to get good outcomes, and you've got a big one on your hands, so I wish you well. Thank you. Um, over in Lowen, we don't have much competition, not like Ripon. What I'm hoping is that you will, in your $19 billion commitment to renew and, and fast-track uh, passenger rail services, that the first $300 million you spend is to return passenger rail to Horsham and Hamilton in the first term of your next government. Katrina, thanks for the question. Um, people said to me, oh, well, you know, some of the journalists said, oh, you're doing this on electoral grounds. If I said if I was doing it on electoral grounds, then I'd never have committed, if I look at a pendulum, and I think they're very deceptive because some seats have got a big margin but are actually quite vulnerable, um, I'd never have made some of the commitments which we did. But it's not about that. It's about a genuine attempt to grow the whole state. Now in Lowen, for instance, which is Emma Keeley's, her margin I think is what, 70%, so 70-30, um, which you know we never take for granted one bit because it's, it might be that on paper, but in reality, you've got to work every day for it. That's why we want to bring back country passenger services from an stall in Ararat, obviously in Louise Staley's seat at Ripon, which is marginal, but Horsham is one. Hamilton is the other. And the ability for us to bring those services back is actually much quicker than others, as you know because the quality of the track is already the Melbourne-Adelaide line to Horsham in particular, so the quality of the track is already at, uh, at the rate where we need it to be. The speed of the passenger trains uh, beyond Ararat, or speed of trains, pa current passenger trains, the overland is 110 at diesel hauled. It can be at least that for a long haul velocity. Uh, they can do 160. We'll re-gear them to do 200, but they can do 110 on the current track, which is a reasonable time frame. Um, and uh, apart from an extra passing loop near Stall, the infrastructure is pretty well uh, in place. We just need to lease the track slots off ARTC. Uh, as you can imagine, it's like uh, an air traffic control now coming on the, the interstate lines. So you're right, to Horsham, it's actually not as difficult a proposition as some other lines. Um, and they will require literally a small stabling siding and a loop in Horsham, another passing lane in Stall, and uh, probably the use of what was called the dock platform in Ararat on the standard gauge to then have the broad gauge come alongside it. And it's not a long, it's not a difficult proposition. Again, people say you'll be spending billions to do these things. Actually, no. Actually, no. 
Then the other argument I got from one journalist, well, no one's going to take it. Well, with great respect, if I have a look at the 1151 service from Al Alamein to Camberwell uh, on a weeknight, there's not many people taking that train either, but it doesn't mean we close it all down. It means you provide a service. It's a service, it's a mindset change. That's why bringing back country rail is a priority for us. Hi, Matthew. Jenny O'Connor from Indigo Shire. Um, Matthew, you were talking about energy in terms of the onshore gas and um, I think, despite what you said about the fracking issue, I think the lock the gate people and farmers won't be too happy with that idea. But nevertheless, you also talked about sustainability for kids and grandkids. So I'm interested in what is your position on renewable energy incentives for um, across Victoria and the opportunities there right across rural Victoria to, for solar and wind? Um, <coughs> I guess the first one, again, around um, the gas policy. Well, the gas policy is very straightforward. We've got a, a clean natural resource, we should avail it. It is cleaner than coal, we should use it. We need to transition from coal in a sensible and uh, a mapped time frame, which we had, which uh, Hazelwood preceded about for five years, which has left the Lord Trobe Valley in dire straits. Um, you know, we have time frames in which we need to remove out of uh, traditional coal-fired energy, you know, your lawn does and a number of others do obviously around the country and we need to keep to them and provide the alternatives which are going to be solar and uh, I think gas is part of that transition. That's why I think we need to look at gas because it is part of that transition. It is also cheaper nowadays and will become a cost, a cost um, argument if I go to market and ask for extra supply. Well, market isn't going to invest in coal because coal's, first of all, you're going to be unavailable to, you're not going to be able to attract finance. Secondly, the, and my family's from the Latrobe Valley and all worked in Yulon W, Loyang A, Hazelwood, and they will say it's not a long-term job prospect, so why would you do it? So you need to be realistic and we need to be realis realistic about it. So I think procedural power around solar is very important. I think it's very, it's quite tangible. Um, having got solar at home some years ago, I would say the one point that, Solar's great, but it's obviously great when it's sunny. It's not great when you want to use the power when you might come home at night. So the battery technology is very important. I think batteries is what is the missing link in the whole discussion. Solar is fantastic. My solar blazes away. Uh, I've got about 15 or 16 panels. They blaze away. They power everything. They're magnificent. But then as soon as it gets cloudy, they drop off and it goes from, you know, 4,200 down to 850 and it powers maybe the air conditioner if you're lucky. The battery technology is what we need to look at uh, investing in or whether there's bulk schemes. I know some councils have done that. I'm keen to have, uh, should we win some of these discussions around, I know my council, Manningham, did this to put the panels in. They did bulk buys on panels, which was immensely successful. Bulk buying on batteries is something else I think we should be looking at as well and whether that's a state with council or assisting council how we do it because I think that's the missing link in order to get a number, a lot of houses, businesses, it's the use of the batteries and I think that's what's, that's something we're really keen to look at. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, Councillor Pat Chewy from Rural Shire. Uh, many of the uh, regional and rural councils have uh, a lot of locked infrastructure just waiting for the other ingredient to make it uh, viable for what you're talking about, to accept growth and offer the sort of uh, living conditions that uh, people are looking for. Uh, we have one, for example, at Bungaree Wallace, where we have freeway access, we have train um, lines through those towns, we <coughs> have natural gas, town water, schools, kindergartens, everything except the sewerage. Now, we even have our local water authority and ourselves. We have a plan ready. It needs funding, and we hope that you consider that. But many of our rural councils need that ingredient. Uh, we didn't sue a Blackwood, which was promised many years ago. We come up with a sensible plan that saved $20 million, and we put in innovative, uh, cost-effective septic systems in houses that had problems. There's many ways we can bring forward infrastructure with government support to our rural councils and our rural communities that then make it possible for us to accept the, uh, the growth that you're trying to disperse. Like, as I said, Bungaree Wallace and now from Melbourne has every ingredient except sewerage. Uh, and many of our communities are like that, just need some help with one of the ingredients that's needed. What sort of initiative do you see in that field we used to have a program, we don't at the moment, that might assist us to say we're ready. Pat, that's, that would be, it's a good example because to me that is the, that's what you have a population commission for. I mean, here we're trying to decentralise, you're missing whether it's one or two key ingredients, it might be a school which we can then avail, avail through a developer contribution or it might be a, 
uh, PPP, it might be on budget, whatever it might be, but we need to identify what are some of those issues on specific locations that hold them back. I know something similar, or there's similar examples out in Latrobe, speak of Latrobe again, where uh, you know they are saying we need certain investments to make uh, residential developments take away or take off, which haven't been able to be uh, achieved. And of course, you've got government, the planning department, who want to move on some of these, and will come to you and say, you know, you've got population targets. Where what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Well, you say we need this from government to make it happen. Of course, the planning department talks to no one, and nothing ever happens. The whole role of a population commission is to manage that kind of growth is to manage the sustainable growth of what we're doing outside of Melbourne. Um, it's one of the reasons we've committed to bring back the Flying Squad to assist particularly country and rural councils with planning applications. It's the whole reason we want to conclude the um, uh, PSP regime in the Melbourne growth boundary and then move the VPA out to assist with particularly um, peri-urban but also regional councils to structure planning because that's where the mechanisms are to identify those kind of gaps. As you say at the moment, there's no real mechanism. There's never been a mechanism to identify the gap. You can tell one department who's giving you a target, but then if you tell them what the weakness is, it'd never go anywhere. The whole role of a commission is to bring that together and to identify those gaps. And I hope, that's my hope, that it is, uh, that that will be the repository for ways to fix some of those issues so that we know if we invest in that for $2 million, $3 million, it can then avail, avail of sustainable growth in a peri-urban area, which, as you say, is close to rail, which is the key driver of some of that growth, which can then be done properly. Yeah, uh, Robert Vance, Pirano Shire. I heard you say that you intend to appoint a minister for the greater city of Geelong. I put it to you that it might be a great idea to appoint a minister for the rest of rural Victoria so that we've got a direct line of contact with somebody that's got some punch in government rather than have to go to all the different ministers in different departments. And uh, it's been my experience over the year, years, that when you go to these ministers, they listen to what you say, but don't necessarily get the results that we require. If we're gonna develop rural Victoria, I think it'd be a wonderful idea to have a minister in charge of that area so that everything can be directed to the one point and then goes back to you as the Premier, if you're successful. The, the, three, the three ministry positions, the three positions that I'd announce that we'd appoint are a Minister for Population, which would be the Premier, a Minister for Geelong, which would be standalone, and a Minister for Decentralisation. Now, whether the Minister for Decentralisation is called the Minister for Rural Development or whatever you've termed it as, the whole point is that is the person you're talking about. The person who's responsible for the decentralisation agenda is that minister. That is the role of that person. Their job in government is to assess everything that comes before cabinet, the cabinet briefs, the subcommittee briefs, the appointments, the structures, and to put in place the government's long-term objective of decentralisation. And um, it doesn't sound like a lot, but in fact it's an enormous job. Um, it will need to be a standalone person who sits there and, like Digby Crozier did, the then member for Portland, their role is to look at everything the government's doing and finding those incentives with both the Population Commission, the Taxation Review, which will be chaired by or managed with the Treasurer, and I noticed David Morris, who is here, the Shadow Minister for Finance, Shadow Minister for Local Government. And that person's role uh, in the Minister for Decentralisation is to put in place that program. So you will have that person, and that person will be the Minister for Decentralisation. Uh, Matthew, thank you. Ma Malcolm Hole, Wellington Shire. As you're well aware, the eastern part of the state's going through a crippling drought. Yep. And talking to some of the other councils from uh, the top part of the northern state, the, the dry period started to hit, hit there pretty well too. The the issue that we've got that yeah, the concentration is on the rural sector, the, the farm, the drying up of the dams, but we've also got the added on flow of the commercial and retail business sector who are, are struggling and you're starting to see empty shops coming in into the towns now. And, and as from a council point of view, uh, we've been given information about how some of the, the uh, retailers can't pay their, their rent um, and then putting staff off. The, lo the long-term um, prospect, uh, barring when the rain's gonna come, is that the contribution from the government into Victoria at the moment is $5 million uh, in various shapes of form. 
uh, compared to $1 billion in New South Wales. The sector, particularly the farming sector, is asking for a re-look at the, the assistance we can, that can be given, whether it be you know, half rates, um, uh, transport on costs on, on fodder, um, and then the, the big worry, the big scourge, is when the rain comes, and we don't know when that's going to be, is that they haven't been able to super, and therefore recovery is going to be a damn hard time to put the um, financial uh, strength back into these communities. Have you got any plans that in 38 days, or th was it, sorry, we'll make it 39 days, the day after you're in there, uh, as to how much day you're going to throw around where you're going to put it? Malcolm, it's a very good question because I think a $5 million uh, relief package would probably be about 500 metres worth of those wire rope barriers that are being installed out through your council, um, which I think is quite insulting. In fact, when I drove out to... Um, uh, I was out near Bairnsdale, or oh, would have been about two weeks ago now. Um, it's amazing. You go through your lawn north and, you know, the grass is this high, thick and lush, and you get up the road, um, you know... 45 minutes or so and be on sale and it is like that and um, it's patchy I think which is also difficult for some people to realise how, how certainly north as you go um, north of the highway it is quite significant and quite substantial. We've said that the first point we must, must have is immediate rate relief, immediate rate relief, um, that's a first point. The second point is going to be I think what you say particularly around recovery and while we can't identify that or a cost benefit on that just now, um, certainly rate relief is going to be the immediate because that is money that's obviously being factored into a farm budget that can then be used for other, available for other purposes. It means the state then provides the councils with the equivalence of the rate revenue that you will lose, but that means the farming community obviously who are affected or identified don't need to pay those rates until we uh, uh, tear it back or have we manage it. Um, oh, look, I, I've been out there and I know it's been an issue for in some areas more than 18 months. It's not just a two-week or three-week or five-month affair. It's been more than 18 months for some areas. Yeah, and I was up uh, with Peter Walsh in, in the Swan Hill contingent. Well, no, in Swan Hill and just north of Swan Hill, actually, um, about a week ago, last Monday. And again, um, it's very, very dry. I took the back roads on the way back through Corong Vale and others. And again, through those areas, it is still fairly dry. So I think we need to start at rate relief and then work up to a number of other pack packages, particularly around recovery. Um, but look, I, I hear your point, it is we're going to need more than $5 million and uh, New South Wales have shown just how b big they believe the problem is for their state. While ours may not be as equivalent as big, it is certainly very, very substantial and unfortunately it will require quite a substantial financial response. Would you please thank Matthew and... <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew, and uh, good luck.